Okay, uh, we are jumping around a little bit. If you recall, last week we did sessions four and five. Uh, I delayed session three, which is our one today, which is just an introduction to business process design. And the reason I've invited Brian Schneider to join me is that Brian and I, for many years, have worked together under the brand, as you can see up here, BPM Africa, business process specialists. Uh, Brian does some superb training and uh, process design and engineering, et cetera. And I'm going to ask him to pop in on the presentation from time to time as we go through this morning. So, Brian, welcome to the show. Oh, nice to be with you, Rod. Welcome to everybody. It's good to be in the webinar. Okay. Now, just before we kick in, we have to have a, a word from our sponsors because without them, we wouldn't be able to do these free seminars. So, first and foremost, Colby Speech Analytics. Uh, South African designed, engineered for South African English, Afrikaans, Zulu, and Sisutu. Uh, it's been a remarkable success. Uh, it was launched in uh, Q1 of this year, and already there are over 30 contact centers throughout South Africa and around about 3,500 agents uh, using this remarkable tool. So if you see um, opportunity to have speech analytics in your contact center, it's highly affordable. And uh, just give me a line, uh, drop me an email and I'll set up a uh, demo. Uh, secondly, smart technologies, everything you've ever dreamed of in a call center platform uh, with all components in a full omni-channel solution, along with analytics, AI, QA, uh, HR management. It's, it's quite something to see. So if you are seriously considering upgrading to a full omni-channel solution or replacing perhaps a system that you're paying in US dollars. Uh, the smart solution is really worth looking at. Intelli BPO is a new startup boutique BPO operation based in both Randburg and Durban. And I see we do have Jackie Samuel from BPO, uh, Intelli BPO Durban joining us today. Thank you for being with us. And then last but not least, Axtel headsets and um, Hopefully the audio quality today is a lot better. And it's with thanks to my good friends at Axtel. This is the unit that I'm using today. It's a Voice UC28. Absolutely brilliant construction design, noise cancelling capabilities, a really nice uh, control panel on here. As you can see everything from mute and volume controls, your USB. And so thanks to uh, Thanks to the guys, Jason Handel down in Durban at Extel. I uh, really appreciate the uh, use of this headset. Moving on, here we go. Let's uh, get into it. So there are our introductions, and I've introduced you to Brian from BPM in Africa as a kickoff. So there is the, the session we're doing today, Business Process Design Workshop, and it really is an introduction. When I do the live webinar uh, seminars, and it actually runs to the full two, two and a half hours because we take uh, the group through team exercises of actually drawing up initial business process design. So uh, we won't obviously be able to do that in the virtual sense. But uh, Brian, in the new year, let's put a workshop together where delegates will actually be hands on designing processes. Yeah. Okay. We've, we've got that. We'll certainly put that into effect, right? Just remember that the chat line is open and um, also the Q&A lines as well. So please feel free to chip in if you want uh, anything explained in more detail. So business process, the key to effectiveness and efficiencies. And I think Brian will concur with me as a consultant. And uh, we also have uh, John Poulton on the seminar today, John. Thank you very much for joining us. We're all, all consultants in this space, and I think we all concur that uh, when we come across a toxic call center, if we're doing audits, uh, the chances are that the core problem lies in the business processes. Uh, Brian, would you agree with me on that? You've done dozens of assessments and audits. What, what is your view on that? Yes, consistently, right. that's what we're finding, that uh, the processes underlining the delivery to customers is where the problems are. So they're misaligned to the important touch points with customers. 
Excellent. No, we agree on that point, that's for sure. Uh, going forward, you know, I pose the question here, you know, why are clearly defined business processes vital to the contact center? And I might go a little bit further, not only clearly defined processes, but uh, well engineered, well thought through, designed according to international standards, well documented, process ownership, which is the subject we'll talk about in the next few minutes. So uh, there are, I remember correctly, 14 good reasons. So let's start with the first one. Simply to be able to plan and to manage your call center. It, in the absence of any uh, well-documented processes, a call center is a shambles. There's no other word for it. It simply cannot operate effectively and efficiently. So, Brian, you, you would uh, come across many a contact center that is just an absolute disaster. And once again, would you elaborate on your experience on yes. implementing process design? Yeah, so just if we talk about managing the call center, Rod, or any operational space, so there's a lot of activities that go on and they're carried out by a number of people. Sometimes it may be a call center of 10 people, and whether we're getting to some of the very bigger contact centers and there's lots of people. So business process management, one of the its targets and its outputs is to bring order to that chaos. Whether you are a wholesaler or a miner, or if you run an aircraft, uh, uh, organization. Thanks, Brian. Okay, so here we go. These are my 14 good reasons for process design. Roles and responsibilities. Unless we have a complete picture of how processes flow in and out of the contact center, and this is where it allows us to identify who does what in the contact center. It's the starting point of establishing those roles and responsibilities. Secondly, we are now able, because we can understand how the processes flow through the center, we're able to clearly define the skill sets, the training requirements, and I'll go further as to say the actual competencies of the people involved in the various steps or various stages of that process. Thirdly, defining business rules. Um, I don't think there's ever been formal research on it, but it has been my experience that a lot of delays and inefficiencies in a contact center come about through a lack of clear definition of business rules. Ryan, would you comment on that? Yeah, right. We find that um, often going into businesses where they don't know how work gets done and that uh, the staff are in the same position until you start defining our processes and make sure that we understand how the work gets done, then the rules can be set up so that people understand what is expected to get the right outcome for the business. And that takes me to the next point, which is the escalation processes. Once again, when we do audits on contact centers, we see incredible delays in workflow, uh, purely because in the, many individuals don't know their limitations, how far they can, they can uh, commit the company, or at what level certain processes do need to be escalated to senior management. So once again, a really, really important um, reason for astutely designed and, and documented processes. Monitoring efficiencies, and I should really add to that monitoring inefficiencies, because once again, only when we have processes in place and we are able to literally sit with a stopwatch and do time and motion studies, are we able to identify flaws in the flows and the process and the workflows and therefore efficiencies or inefficiencies. Ryan, you've come across a lot of inefficiencies that have been rectified through process re-engineering. Yeah, so Rod, one of the first things we do is look at the metrics of the process so that we can start to identify what is the standard that we want to achieve and the people often know that. I must just also give a little bit of input in terms of uh, defining the escalation procedures. That is almost talking exactly to first call resolution. And that's what we're finding, that those escalation procedures are not in place. So we're having rework coming back into the contact center because there's calls coming back again and again because things have to be escalated. We, we haven't defined the process so somebody can 
resolve a query first time. Actually, you raise a very good point there. In fact, it goes back to training then as well, because it's, a, it's an empowerment issue. Uh, once we know the process, we set the limitations, we understand the escalation procedures, we can then train and empower up to certain levels. Would you agree with that, Brian? Yes, 100% right. Excellent. So then we're looking at efficiencies. Um, cost control. Now, this is one of my favorite subjects because, quite frankly, it is a sad reality that very few contract centers, managers or professionals are actually able to understand the cost modeling in their call center. The cost per minute, the cost per second, the cost per process, the cost per resolution, all of those criteria uh, become incredibly important, particularly as we're moving now into a world of reality, I believe, where return on investment or whether it's just increased staffing technologies uh, is all about cost modeling. And uh, as you'll see in another module, which we'll be talking about building cost models, uh, and I'll have another guest on that session. We'll probably do it uh, next week, next week, Tuesday. But uh, without process design, it is impossible, in my opinion, to get a control over costs. So, Brian, you've had experience in that space. In yes. Yeah, right. So we're looking at, even in our current project, the the cost of research, we just look at the the people who are responsible for these processes and that their time is used efficiently. We need to get a grasp of it. It's our biggest cost normally in an organization, our staffing costs, and it's sadly often overlooked. Correct, absolutely. Um, Process design in, used for forecasting, capacity planning, so even astute workforce managers would go back to the processes in many instances to validate their <coughs> predictions. And uh, also where we are possibly looking at expanding our operations or ramping up operations, once again, critical to have hands-on with well-designed processes. Um, IT systems design and integration. Perhaps this should have been the first one because uh, many a time um, I personally have had those instances where organization, the first question is we need a call center. And I say, show me your processes so we can understand the IT and the systems and the technology requirements. And if, in the absence of those processes, almost impossible to define the technology requirements and the scaling impossible to put together an RFP and RFI and really uh, understand and enable the organization to procure the most appropriate technologies. Um, Brian, you and I had that experience last year when we did that large um, RFP. Would you comment on that? Yes, right. I can, uh, with, um, with sadness, uh, I'm seeing it uh, frequently that um, the specification in terms of uh, technology design and it's over specification because we haven't made sure that we understand our processes uh, and how people do work in our organization at present. So to, uh, there are companies out there operating their call centers and their organizations with over spec technology, which are paying for a number of features which they don't use. I think that's the one aspect, absolutely. And uh, you said Brian and I've worked together on several RFPs and uh, we, we start with the process design and from there we, we look at the actual functional requirements. What does this operation need immediately? What does it need in the next six or 12 months? And what does it envisage needing going forward into the future where we might be looking at, at AI and at um, bots, etc. So another critical reason why business process design is an essential part of running an and of course, reporting management and information and analytics. This is a big issue and more and more emphasis I see being placed on reporting and analytics. Uh, in fact, all of the research that we have available currently clearly indicates that uh, access to information and analytics is a high priority item. And in fact, for those uh, logged in today, um, we have been, we'll say we, the consortium of us, have been researching the technology 
trends in South Africa going forward into 2021. It's been an extensive uh, research exercise in partnership with Knowledge Executive. And that is being released on Monday, the 14th of December, uh, the final report and will become available. We are holding a webinar. We will be discussing the highlights of the research study. And uh, just to give a preview to that, number one uh, expenditure going forward envisaged by the big operators, contact center operators in South Africa is in fact in AI and, uh, in, and analytics. So very exciting. Then we hope you all log in on that webinar. Um, another point that uh, process design, and you'll see as we move forward in this morning's session, uh, does highlight is the, the requirement for certain documents, whether they are virtual documents uh, within the system, knowledge management, et cetera, or physical documentation, uh, the process design should highlight where those documents need to be. Any comment on that, Brian? Yeah, right on both points. So in terms of reporting and managing of the information analytics, there's rich data in the contact center and the contact center technologies often give us performance reports, which are really um, important, but we have to use that data in our analytics to understand how our processes are delivering value to our customers. And that's where I think the next step is going to be to make sure that we can get that that insight into how are we impacting our customers is it positive is it negative and then your yeah, do, documents wrote this uh, it's critical that we manage them and the flow of them and business process management makes that much easier thank you for that brian um standardization and um, particularly where we have multiple operations and uh, brian and i both had uh, experience working with clients with multiple sites uh, where there's a, been an absence of standardization or in fact an absence of any form of documentation on the processes and you would find that uh, through anecdotal uh, transfer of skills or knowledge uh, one site would run a whole series of processes one way and uh, literally 20 kilometers up the road the other site would have a completely different view of how those processes should be run. So once again, a, a really important element of process of, of business processes within a contact center. In fact, any business for that matter is the, uh, the concept of standardization. Right, and of course, if I could, yes, please, Brian. So, sorry, I uh, apologize for interrupting, but no. if I can just chip in, it's actually standardization as a core to business process. So what business process delivers is a consistent delivery to your customer at the best standard that the business uh, wants to achieve and that's really what you want to do whether you're a mine uh, a coal mine uh, delivering coal you want the quality to be of a consistent uh, level and you want it to be uh, consistently uh, produced and those are the kind of things that uh, is relevant to any business. Right, thank you, Brian. Um, down here at 12, it's a bit of a repetition of number two, but as you can see in all of these other foregoing uh, reasons, um, training on, and skills development becomes really important and a lot easier where we have very clearly defined standards. It's a lot easier to assess people's skills and assess the skills gaps as well. Um, so that really sets the scene for the good reasons to have a, oh, I'd forgotten about, sorry, I'm running ahead of the game here. The session planning. Ooh, how many times do we hold somebody in a position where we know we should be promoting them, but the person above them or the new role that we might put them into, um, we, we, we can't let go of the person because they've acquired skills, they've acquired a knowledge of those processes, and therefore they tend to be stuck in that particular position. Um, Brian, you've had that experience too, I believe. Yes, right, we have exactly that, and it uh, becomes an even greater risk if uh, the person uh, sees that he is being perhaps blocked 
and then he decides to leave. So that knowledge and skill goes with them. Mm. So it's a very important reason why we document those processes. And so uh, the impact on, on, on staff attrition, once again, could be taken back to astute processes. And uh, finally, if I remember correctly, disaster recovery and business continuity. And we've actually seen uh, real life examples where for a particular reason, one site, and I won't mention the name, but it's a, a very large medical insurance company, uh, had a situation where it wasn't a fire or a building falling down. Ironically, it was the technicians working on the air conditioning system had inadvertently tipped a drum of toxic uh, materials, liquids, into the air conditioning system. And uh, the entire building, several thousand people had to be evacuated and uh, were not able to get back into that building for a couple of days. And it was purely because the systems and the processes were impeccably designed. Uh, they were able to relocate several hundred agents onto their disaster site recovery site, literally within an hour. And everybody knew exactly what to do, purely because those processes were up on their screens, in their help files, in the knowledge management system. So 14 very good reasons. Uh, Brian, have you got any more that you would like to add to this? No, Rod, just to reiterate, it's exactly that. Business process management is about putting those processes in the hands of competent people. They might not be even your staff, but they'll be uh, people that you trust to do your work and they can carry out the task with minimum supervision. Right, so let's go on a little bit further into this. So this is, as I said, um, an absolute, just an introduction to process design using the DPMN method. Uh, down at the bottom of the screen, um, you, you'll see a, a links there to uh, BPMN.org, which is the international body for the promotion of standards, and in particular, this particular standard, the DPMN model method. Brian, you uh, have certification in this. Would you just comment on that, please? Yeah, so um, the there's a couple of bodies were set up just very briefly to make sure that we can all understand processes in terms of a diagram. And that's where this BPMN comes in, the Business Process Management Notation. It's uh, at the standard 2.0 there couple of organizations around the world and that's why we're able to uh, fast track a lot of our development of technology and other services because we're able to share processes very easily and collaborate. That's, that's what brings a lot of uh, different departments in business together, get around the table to discuss processes that impact all of our departments. Excellent. Thank you very much, Brian. I'm just going to go through this, and these are, as I said, not even process 101, this is process 99. So very basically, we're starting off there with a, a set of icons, and in this case, the first set of icons are defined as tasks, as you can see, basic task, lap sub processes, which I'll elaborate on shortly, certain tasks are repeated, and collapsed and repeated, and then for convenience sake, we tend to, or we can, start blocking sub-processes into groups. So first thing to remember is a simple set of icons, the rectangle with the rounded corners, that's our tasks. We then have two types of flows where we have a particular sequence flow. It might be, for example, a document that is physically taken in, it is physically checked, it's perhaps signed off, rubber stamped, passed on to somebody else for data capture, etc. So there's a physical flow of that process. And subsequently, we might have a situation where using our technology, a message would flow between business units. Once again, I'll expand on that shortly. Uh, we'll introduce you to the, the concept of pools and lanes uh, that are used in the design of processes. And we'll then show you also these icons here, start of a process, end of a process, start with a rule and start with a the timer. There are 
others, and, but we're not going to get into the sophisticated levels. And then, of course, we have the ubiquitous gateway, uh, the yes, no, the approved, not approved, um, proceed, escalate, and you'll see how these gateways are used uh, effectively. So if we have a look at it here, basically we're looking at tasks, we're looking at processes, we're looking at the pools and lanes, and we're looking at events and gateways. So there are fundamentally five principal icons that we would use in starting to draw up our processes. Brian, any inputs on that? No, Rod, you've, you've put it perfectly. So it, for the textbook, it's uh, uh, processes, a number of activities that are completed in sequence, and there's got to be a start, and there's got to be an output, an outcome or an end to it. Right. That takes us into the pools and lanes concept, uh, which is really a way in which we are able to divide up our organization into logical pools or lanes, if you like, and you'll see how that uh, manifests in a few moments. So I'm going to use an, a really oversimplified model here just to uh, get the fundamentals of process design in place. Now, let's say, for example, I'm employing a new uh, sales rep. Brian, you're going to be my new rep. I have a um, theoretical wholesale soft drink sales and distribution business. And either I can send Brian out into the field with an existing rep and he would learn the processes anecdotally from somebody else and possibly pick up some bad habits in the, in the process. Uh, or alternatively, we can sit down and literally in the space of 10 minutes, I can show Brian exactly how the business runs. So take a look at this and if bear with me, it's uh, oversimplified. So what we've done here, we've taken a pool, but basically the sales department and split it into our external sales force and internally our order processing. Once again, oversimplified accounts or finance departments split into credit control and billing. Down at the bottom here, I call it dispatch in a pool in its own lane, which is uh, warehousing, dispatch, transportation, deliveries, etc. Very simple. Uh, example. So you'll remember the event, which is the start of the process. So uh, the rep, the instruction here is go out and get the order. Simple as that. And you'll see a little plus sign here. This means that behind that very simple statement or task of get the order, there may be dozens of sub processes and other instructions um, which would, you know, good system be available simply by double clicking on that and will take the person through to the lower levels. So get the order might be um, go to the also go to the supermarket or the spa sparta, uh, engage with the owner, go and check the current stock, write up an order, bringing them up to, to required stock levels, get the signature on the order form, etc. So that would be the sub processes uh, behind that task. The instruction here is uh, don't wait to return to the office. Our business runs on phone in the order. As soon as you've got the order, go out to the car, call it into the office. Once again, the sub processes in there would be the details of how to complete the order form, the numbers to call, how to place the order in the office. Here we have the, the process flows through into the office, into the order processing, where the task is simply enter the order data into the system. It flows through to accounts department there. As you can see, these are message flows. I should put dotted lines in there. And the first task there is to check the credit. So Brian has come in with a 10,000 Rand order. Does that particular customer have a 10,000 Rand credit availability? So we have a decision. If it's not okay, then this needs to be escalated to the perhaps senior manager or if the order is of significant size to the CEO or the managing director or some other escalation process. On the other hand, in this example, we're going to say it's just fine. It's okay to proceed. So it goes through to the billing department simply to produce an invoice, which has a function. It uh, perhaps 
prints out a picking list in the uh, warehouse where our storeman draw, uh, draws the stock. That's his task there. Pack the goods, perhaps he puts it onto pallets and shrink wraps it or whatever the process is in there. Deliver it to the customer and there you see an end of process. So what are we seeing here? A very, very simple, easy to explain uh, flow of a process through the organization. Brian, this is uh, oversimplified in terms of the way you train it, but would you comment on this, Mark? No, no, Rod, uh, it is critical. Uh, what you said is, is perfect because the, the, the process modeling technology, a lot of it's free, it's uh, very intuitive. It has, uh, most of them have their, um, their basis in Excel or similar. So it's something that people will be very familiar with. It's very rich in terms of semantics in being able to explain what those uh, different elements uh, talk to. And mostly they provide very detailed information in the technology to tell you how to use it. So I must say it's, uh, it's, it's one of the best ways for the businesses to get competitive advantage. And what we're seeing more and more is it's just that those organizations where they have strong business process management culture are racing ahead of the opposition. Excellent. Thanks, Brian. And I will be expanding on the various tools that are available. Some people might be familiar with a tool like Microsoft Visio, uh, which is brilliant, but somewhat expensive. And we'll be introducing you shortly to a very uh, powerful tool called Visagi, which actually has a free um, a freeware um, modeling tool to, to use. But we'll come on to that shortly. So as you can see here, very simply start the process, carry out various tasks, follow a particular flow, make decisions where appropriate and escalations, and very simply an end of process. So very simple model we have here. Then we have different types of tasks, and this is an important one. We have, as I mentioned, basic tasks, collapse tasks, etc. So in this example, the basic tasks here are make a cup of tea, would be place the kettle under the tap, turn on the tap, fill the water, turn off tap, switch off kettle, when boiled, switch off. And it would be shown in a flow similar to that. Um, when we run the masterclass uh, live seminars, I pose the question to the delegates is, there's a, there's a really important task missing in this short list a very important task and the clue to it is it's a really messy task simple as that and that is take the lid off the kettle now it might sound funny but when we start working on processes it's critical that we think down to the most granular level possible and i'll expand on that and show you just how granular we need to think because uh, there's the quiz. What's missing is to take the lid off the kettle. Messy clue. So here is making a cup of tea. And this comes from a particular workshop that I ran a, a while back. And I asked the delegates to spend 10 or 20 minutes really breaking down and becoming granular in how to make a cup of tea. As you can see, we got to number 53, but it actually can go on to even more than that. So critical that we look at each one of these, open the cupboard door, remove the kettle from the cupboard, place the kettle on the counter, there's open the lid of the kettle. I won't dwell on this, but suffice to say, think granular and try not to think in isolation. Um, I believe, and Brian, your comment on this is working in teams so that one person will come up with an idea and somebody says, oh, but you left out, you know, remove the saucer, place the saucer on the counter, etc. Brian, quick comment? Yeah, Rod, very, uh, very pertinent and very uh, applicable as of today. I'm working with the coal mine in Botswana. And what we need to think about is that we're writing these processes for somebody who doesn't know. That's what we've got to do. We okay. often take it for granted. 
the uh, the skill and ability of a person, but they don't necessarily know our culture or local rules and regulations or uh, situations yeah. of things. So we need to be very clear who the audience is and what level we're going to um, detail these processes to. But we're not writing them for ourselves. We're writing them for another audience. I think that's a really important point. And there's an example I show in a few slides uh, where we've built specifically systems like this with knowledge management behind it so that anybody could literally walk into the job and in 10 minutes they'll be executing that particular component of the process. So once again, we have start a process, we simply decide to make a cup of tea. The end of process is I finished drinking it. And as you've seen from the previous slide, there can be several hundred tasks that form the, the gap between those two. So simple icons here, start the process, end the process. Here we have a start with a rule. Now if, it, if we stay within the, the T space, a start with the rule might be, um, if I'm running an office, I might brief the uh, team that makes the, looks after our catering. When a guest arrives, make a cup of tea. Don't come in and ask whether you want tea or you don't want tea. Simply make the tray, bring the tea through. That's our standard business process. So it starts with a particular business rule. And we might have another icon here that says starts with a timer, which is, I don't care what's happening in the business, at 10 o'clock, tea will be served. So there's a particular date, time, event that triggers the start. It could be we run the invoices on the 22nd of the month or the statements runs at certain days and times of the month. So we would use the, that particular icon to designate a particular start time. So once again, we have sequence flow and message flow. And in contact centers, a lot of what we do is you'll see in the next few slides, starts with message flows and moves into sequence flows. There's our gateway, our point of decision. There's a lot of work that we can do using decisions. We've got some examples to show you. But there's our message flow. It starts with a very happy, yeah, I'll say, customer calling our call center and triggering a message flow into the contact center where it now becomes a process. Back to our T, there's our start of process. The process or sequence flow ends up with our cup of tea on the table. So these are basic principles that apply across the board. And now we come to a, a real live example. This is a high level view of a basic restaurant. And as you'll see, restaurants, call centers, there's a lot of similarity between it. So I'm going to now just walk through the various components of this and you will see that we have various uh, icons that you're now familiar with from start of process or to, to various tasks. We have message flows and we have sequence flows. So come with me on a stroll through this uh, particular restaurant. So as a customer enters the restaurant, we have the start of the process. Um, so we can designate that as the actual beginning of a process. When the customer leaves, is one part of the end of process. As you'll see here, we have a second end of process, which is end of process from an administrative point of view. The, the, the concept here is we're going to have multiple triggers to start various processes, and we can have multiple endpoints that would designate the end of a particular process or sub-process in there. So once again, oversimplification is our end of process. So let's take a look at this. We put the customer now and the customer environment into a pool and the restaurant and the administrative functions, the kitchens, etc. Uh, what happens behind the swing doors is in a second pool. As you'll see, this is also divided into a waiter's lane the maitre d' or the manager's lane and the kitchen lane, swim lane. We put the waiter in the lane and the kitchen in the lane. Uh, similarly, we could confirm or we could uh, use the term front office 
in terms of a restaurant and back office. Once again, you can see the similarities between contact center and restaurants. So, but customer experience happens in this environment here. It's what they see, how they're treated, the service they get from the, uh, the waiting staff, the managerial staff, uh, the, the seamlessness, hopefully, of the processes, the quality of the food, etc. So, it's all in the customer experience. Uh, our waiter or frontline is equivalent to our call center agent or supervisor. Uh, there's our man so agent, here's our manager or management. And then production is the back end, the fulfillment component. So I don't think there's a hard and fast rule for how one divides a, an organization into pools and swim lanes. Brian, would you briefly comment on that, please? No, no it's, it follows the natural progression of the process, right? You're 100% right. So the, uh, the modeling tools are, are, have got enough feature or feature rich to be able to model and follow the process. So if there are more than one external organization, then it can accommodate that. If there's 20 internals, including technology, then it can include it in those swim lanes. Thank you for that, Brian. So here we're zooming in a little bit down onto this, uh, this graphic. So meet and greet is a task that we've defined. And as you can see, it's the maitre d' or the manager. His task is to receive guests and meet and greet. So once again, it could well have a little plus sign behind it because he is trained in which way he should dress and how to meet the customers, or reservations, etc. So once again, highest possible level simply meet and greet your customers. Here you see a decision tree. Is there, a, let's just go back on that one. Oops, decision tree. Is there a table ready and available? There's a simple model that says, yes, there is, in which case we take the customers through to be seated, or we don't have a table at the moment, in which case we take the customers through to have drinks at the bar. It's another task. As you can see, a little icon in there, mm, sub-processes. Once again, that is a whole series of sub-processes, which are the instructions to our barman on how to make various cocktails. What are the components? What are the recipes for the cocktail? How to pour a, a cocktail? How to open a bottle of wine? How to present the wine? And, and all of those things that go into running a bar, we could have an entire set of sub-processes, but we've simplified it here with the little plus icon. Now you see a, an icon you haven't seen before, which is the thin double circle. Now in the language of business process modeling, that is a conditional or a restart. So something pauses until another set of criteria are met. In this case, we have customers sitting in the bar uh, until such time as the table becomes available. That is the conditional restart of the process. So as soon as the table is available, it moves to the next task, which is to be seated, and the managerial staff can now take the customers through to the restaurant to be seated. Conditional restart. What are we seeing here? We're seeing a couple of documents popping up. So there we have the blackboard with the specials, we have a menu, which is another document. And depending on which um, process modeling tool you're using, for example, if we just take the menu, um, if I was using, uh, for example, Visio, I could double click on that. I could find the PDF version of the current menu. Uh, if I went through that, I could actually drill down and find the, um, the MS Word version of it. And I might even drill down and find the Excel costing model for the menu as well. All in, brought together in one place in one modeling tool. So that's an aside and that takes us into far more sophisticated levels that Brian will take you through when we run the focus courses uh, early in the new year. Okay, so as you can see, the customer is now seated in the, um, in the dining room area. And now the sequence of ordering the food as a task, receiving the food, eating the food, three separate tasks. Now you see that icon expanded sub-processes because 
that could well be first course um, receive it, eat it, second course receive it, eat it, and that could go on all the way until we start ending up with Irish coffees and shooters. Well, not everybody's going down, but um, it just indicates the expanded sub processes. Here we see a message flow, and this is, yeah, if you look carefully, there's the waiter, and he is engaging with the customer and, uh, and collecting messages. He might be memorizing it, writing it down, or putting it into a tablet for that matter. Here is a special request. That is, how, how, for, how would you like your steak done? Is a special request that needs to come through in a message flow into this document here, which goes through to place the order on the kitchen. It might be a, a note, a handwritten note, or it might be technology uh, that pops up on a printer in the kitchen. Are you starting to see how this is a brief, in fact, to people in technology on how to provide the technology enabled processes within the, in this particular case, the restaurant. Brian, a quick comment? Yeah, no, right, you're 100% right. So then that, that, that level of detail does drive the ability for the programmers to now look at this and say, well, we need to enable it. And you're giving them the information that they need to be able to enable your processes. Thank you for that, Brian. So there we take it. So the message flow coming through from the waiter, across those, um, coming across these swim lanes into the kitchen. And here we see the tasks for the kitchen staff. Prepare dish, very simple. Little plus sign. Um, this restaurant may have 150 different dishes. Each one of those, there's a subtask on how to prepare a particular dish, how to plate it, how to present it, and uh, the ingredients, etc. Uh, oops, going forward. Right, so that takes us into another level. So the process of delivering the food to the table, etc., cetera, uh, is now completed. And here we start seeing some more documents popping up. The meal is over. The task here is pay the bill. There's a document. And the plus sign here, pay the bill, is telling us that it could be cash, it could be debit card, it could be credit card, it could be Zapper, it could be uh, PayPal, it could be any other of the payment forms that we're becoming familiar with today. So once again, different sub-processes on how these things are being handled. As you can see, that same document is the system produced in the back office, facilitate payment, and all the sub-processes around that. End of process, customer hopefully very happy, leaves the environment, and end of process here, the organization, the restaurant banks, the money or the credit card slips or whatever is the process in there. So as you can see, this is a incredibly high level, one sheet of A4 paper, but it covers the fundamentals of how this quite a complex uh, operation is run. Um, now, as you will see when we drill down into more sophisticated processes, um, this could end up as several hundred sub-processes or more detailed processes, all linking back to the highest possible level, which is the single sheet of paper. I'm a comment on that. Yeah, right. Um, while we, I'd like to just uh, relate this to the contact center. Um, one of the things that, uh, and to customer experience, uh, what we expect from customer experience, the learning is that we understand what our customer wants in order to make sure that they uh, come back. And normally in terms of a restaurant, there are going to be certain touch points like where they get greeted, the standard of food that they get served and the way they get served and how smooth the, the, they exit the, the restaurant and how pleasant that um, um, experience is. And by having a documented process like that, we can easily understand where those touch points are so that the organization can put the quality control at those spaces. So if we know that the, uh, the maitre d' is over, overseeing the uh, people coming into the restaurant, 
the, uh, the ordering process, the standard of the food that's uh, exiting the kitchen, and that they are smoothly and um, in a really positive way able to exit after the meal, then those people are likely to come back. So that's why uh, the process in this way, it's easy for you to manage that uh, customer experience and then keep on getting those people back to you. If you don't have this view, then it becomes a little bit more difficult. Okay, thanks for that, Brian. And um, I'm going to speed up a little bit here because we are starting to creep in on the time. And uh, what this really just shows is a different way of showing a design process. This was for a, a, a utility in Botswana several years ago. And the brief was to ensure that every single member of staff, including the artisans out there digging ditches and fitting meters, knew and understood how all the processes worked. And this was all done um, prior to actually building the call center because there were no processes, there was nothing documented. And what you're actually seeing here is uh, phase one, which is the how the contact center works. So what you see, these icons that we designed here is where you see a blue icon. There is in the knowledge management system, the policy, the details of the process, and the procedures of this particular function, in this case, contact center agent. Uh, what you see here in the T symbol is there's a training intervention and intranet e-learning of that particular function. And so anybody could literally log on at a workstation and assume the role of call center agent or supervisor because all of the knowledge around that particular process is there on the system. Uh, what you see, oh, let's just go back on that one a wee bit. What you see here is a decision, the call coming into the contact center. There's a, an escalation. Is it a dripping tap or a faulty meter or a burst water main on the main road? If so, that's escalated upwards. So you'll also see the green bars are link this primary process, which is a contact center process, into a customer service let's call it first level of a back office. And here, once again, his or her job is very clearly defined, the processes around it, there's training information available on the intranet. And I won't go into the, pro the details here, but this supervisor puts out work in form of a work order document, you can see up there, to an artisan to go and inspect, comes back, which flows back into, for example, refit a, a, a faulty water meter uh, using a work order, comes back. It then flows through to an accounts department where we have various functions from uh, checking credit availability, billing, etc., stock replenishment. Um, not a lot of detail, but it's simply to show that there's a different way of perhaps uh, presenting these processes to different levels of people in the organization, um, really highlighting that all of this is driving standardization of processes that have been put under the microscope that are constantly being reviewed and refined to drive efficiencies and effectiveness. Uh, this is a, an example of a set of processes. This was a, a contact center put in place all must be seven or eight years ago now. It was a, a pay TV channel, no names mentioned because it didn't last very long. But during the ramp up period, there were between 60 and 100 new agents a week. They ramped up from 50, 60 agents to about 800 agents very, very quickly. Uh, the training period available was very, very short. Uh, there just wasn't enough time. And so by designing processes and making them available on screen, along with all of the necessary prompts, the organization was able to onboard agents incredibly quickly. And we're literally talking about a day and a half in training and then on the floor. There was no other alternative on it. And um, it worked because the processes were clearly defined. There were several hundred processes involved in sub-processes. But as you can see, very simply, um, there is a call coming into the IVR system. 
uh, which we call the CIC system, then pops up an active subscriber. We engage with the customer. Agent opens their subscribers account in the CRM system. Now, here it is. It pulls it up. Here we had actual scripts and prompts to agents. They could literally click on these and they would have a screen prompt as to exactly what to ask the customer. As you can see, you sure you want to transfer the account, yes or no decision. And there are the tasks all the way through to wrapping up the call. So a very simplified version. And without processes, this project would just not have been possible. Very, oops, too fast, so then. There's a, a slightly more complicated version of it, but what you can see is the use of the decision uh, icons or traps, where we can say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and guide that agent all the way through to a fast, accurate, and, and compliant process. Brian, would you comment on that very quickly, please? We are coming yeah. up for the break. Yeah, right. No, um, I think you've covered it perfectly. And uh, it, it really does drive consistency of the outcome. And that's what we're looking for. If you have your processes document, easy to hold people accountable to making sure that the activities that need to happen in the business happen. I think the analogy here is, and we used this in when we were doing the training, because I was actually very involved in it. It's a uh, Either I can give somebody an entire map book, remember the old map books of City of Johannesburg, yep. and, and say, sit down and learn all of that stuff, or I can teach you how to use a Garmin or a Waze or a Google Maps. It's as simple as that, and there's your analogy. Um, okay, so here we have a process that was designed using um, Microsoft uh, Visio. Once again, a very simple, uh, flow here, and there you see the events, you see the version control tables, very important component of it. And um, next slide, this is the tool called Bizagi, B-I-Z-A-G-I, -I, that uh, I think Brian, you and I stumbled upon on this one yeah. 10 years ago, maybe, uh, which is an absolutely free downloadable modeling tool. Ryan, would you comment on the difference between Visio and Bizagi and the resources, yes. please? Yeah, so, um, Rod, the, the, the key difference is that uh, Bizagi is uh, automatically um, enabled for process automation. So, it, there's four um, portions to it, and one of those is the uh, process management engine, which is part of there. So, they the uh, modeling is completely free and it's uh, you can even use it amongst more than one person up to 50 people and you can have your all your businesses processes in one uh, repository and then automation is very simple that you've mapped it it can be automated i think just a point i'd like to raise as well and brian maybe you can expand on it uh, in all of these well what are these modeling tools? Modeling tools such as Visio and Bizagi. Uh, when you actually start compiling these and you start working within these tasks, task properties allow us to build all sorts of components into it. For example, we could designate the, the person doing that task. We could designate uh, their level, perhaps within a salary or a wage structure. We could put in the cost per hour to the organization. Um, so there's a lot of control that we have on the inputs of these tasks. And that means, and we'll cover that in our cost modeling exercise in the next session. And that means you, once we've divine, designed a total process like this, and we know the time allocated within each of those, we know what the SLAs are within those because we've inputted into the, into the properties, um, literally with a few clicks of the mouse, we know the cost of running that entire process uh, within SLA, and therefore the cost overruns if we run out of SLA. Brian, a comment on that? Yes, right, and they've, uh, you can also simulate the processes so you can see what the result will look like if you're looking at redesign. And also now, especially with a lot of the uh, software as a service, 
um, you're able to, as simply as that, um, link the, uh, the modeling tool to your other technologies like your CRM or your ERP system. It's as simple as that. And it'll go and look for the data in the place you you are directing it to. Thanks for that, Brian. We're going to wrap up now, guys. So uh, once again, uh, this is really a recap, and I'll go very quickly through it, and I won't uh, duplicate it. But these were the reasons we started out this session as to why business process modeling is so very important. And I'll go through this, and then there's another comment I think to make. And uh, thank you, John Poulton. Uh, John's been sitting in on this session and sent me a message and he says, I think I might, you might have missed the most important reason. And he says, that is, that, what is to know your processes and that many companies just don't know how inefficient they are until they start modeling. And I think that just reinforces the point that Brian and I have been making. Until you do this exercise, you don't know how inefficient you are, or how efficient you can be. Um, quick comment on that, Brian? Yeah, no, John, spot on. How work gets done, it's a core to business. We need to know at the, at the, the most senior level how work gets done, and this is it. And there's another point which isn't documented here, but um, it's been my experience that for some organizations, the way they work, in other words, their processes, are in fact the core to their IP, their value proposition. If you take, for example, why is it that uh, a company like Take A Lot has evolved into the into probably the most dominant, if not near monopoly? Um, it's because of the processes. They know what they're doing and they've modeled it on the way in which Amazon has secured itself this dominant position. So let's sort of start thinking about the processes within our organization are a big part of our IP and our value proposition. So we're just saying that you can dramatically improve your efficiencies through process engineering. We've seen that time and time again. The moment an organization mandates us to train people how to use these tools, how to think for themselves, how to um, re-engineer their processes, we see dramatic improvements in efficiencies. And cost cutting through those improved processes. In some cases, we, I have case studies where we've seen as much as a 20, 25% reduction in the overall cost of an operation, purely through re-engineering their processes. Um, key points here, accurate processes and documentation, absolutely critical to the success of any contact center. And going the other end of the scale, Without those processes, impossible to plan or scope a CRM, CX, CX technology, omni-channel technology, absolutely impossible. It simply cannot be done. And it's one of the reasons that I think Brian touched on it earlier, why some of the technology solutions for contact centers end up being so expensive, is that the vendors make huge allowance for potential variations because they don't really understand the processes. And so just some free stuff here, just to end off, um, by all means, go and have a look at the uh, bpmn.org website, huge amount of resources in there. You'll find white papers, articles, tutorials, etc. But uh, where we tend to point our clients to is Bazaji, and once again, not only the free modeling tool that you'll find there, but endless tutorials and templates. And uh, in fact, it points to a lot of YouTube videos on exactly how to do it and do self-training. Brian, would you comment on that as a wrap up? Yeah, no, Rod, uh, the, I would say that the quicker we get to understand uh, the core processes of our business, then the quicker we're going to get our competitive advantage and it's really the foundation to any scaling of a business. Excellent, thanks for that Brian. So are there any other questions? I've overrun slightly the hour that I promised but it is less than the two hours that we had originally scheduled. So uh, please uh, feel free to input any questions 
or alternatively simply email me and we'll answer them offline and uh, we refer you to um, any other resources that we might have. So there's for more information, um, anything that you might want. I call it an e-nag, which you're more than likely to, more than happy to send me, or more than welcome to send me uh, about any additional information that you might want in this space. So once again, thanks. And thank you, Brian, in particular, for coming in and helping me through on this particular uh, module. And once again, if there's a business process engineering is something that you really need more information on, I'll gladly link you up with Brian and uh, he can provide you with more information. And once again, my thanks to my four sponsors for making this possible. Our next session, which will be the last one for 2020, uh, Tuesday, that's this time next week. And uh, we'll be in that session, we'll be looking at the module dealing with what we call ABC costing, activity-based costing, which would, is using processes such, such as we've designed and um, discussed today to enable any contact center manager to really understand the cost per process, the cost per task, the cost per um, process interaction in the contact center. Extremely important to be able to build ROI models. So, Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, particularly everybody who's managed to find the time to log in on the session. Uh, it will be up uh, in the recording later today or tomorrow. The slides are already in the Dropbox that I've sent the links through, so feel free to download those and to share them. So without further ado, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Brian, and uh, we look forward to seeing everybody next week. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, guys.